Hi, I'm Matt, one of the Maybridge staff, and I'm aware that a number of people have been checking out what we're doing online in this weird era of lockdown. And let me just say again, whether you'd call yourself a Christian or you're just exploring, you are very, very welcome. One day when we can meet in person, we'd love to have you come and visit. Our real life church is very friendly. We're just a bunch of mostly normal people who have good and bad moments like everyone else. And we try to work out how to follow Jesus together as a community. So please do feel free to get involved or come and take a look. We'd be really glad to meet you or get in touch online. You're very welcome to do that as well. If you have any questions or comments about anything that we do and so on. But here's a question to think about today. What do you really enjoy doing? What is something for you that is really life-giving and fun and, and just brings you lots of joy? There's probably not one answer. I would imagine you have a few and it will look different for each of us. My good friend Tim Ransley, who's part of our church, has a battered old VHS recording of the 1992 general election, which he likes to watch occasionally. Not something I'd enjoy myself, although if you want a taste of something that lasts forever, do borrow that tape. We're all certainly very different, aren't we? But when it comes down to it, aside from our relationships and investing in those, I think we all do that, we, I think we all enjoy some combination of work and rest. We all like to relax, I think that's not debatable, and I would suggest that we all enjoy some form of work. You may disagree on that one. But here's another question. When you imagine heaven, whatever you believe about it, when you imagine heaven, what are you doing? What are you doing there? We're on week three of our four-part series on heaven, and today we're looking at what we actually get up to when we're there. What, what do God's people actually spend their time doing in heaven? Now, we've said in previous weeks, heaven is not some far-off hiding place. Heaven is where God, the creator of all things, lives. It's not part of our physical universe right now, but the big idea is that one day there'll be a new heaven and earth where, where God is and where, we're, where we are will become the same place. And so the new earth will physically be very much like this one, I believe, minus the bad stuff. Great. That was, there was much more on that on week one. If you've missed it, it's, it's all still online. Um, that, we talked about that that week. But in this new physical world, where we have eternity laid out ahead of us, what will we actually do? Will we sit on clouds and play harps forever? No. Will we worship God forever? Yes. But as soon as I say that, I reckon most people's imaginations jump to thinking of an enormous, everlasting church worship service. Is this, is this wonderful, apparently wonderful, new heaven and earth a place where we're just going to sing hymns forever without even so much as a drinks break? The author John Eldridge considers this idea with some despair. He says, nearly Christ every Christian I've spoken with has some idea that eternity is an unending church service. We have settled on an image of the never ending sing along in the sky, one great hymn after another, forever and ever, amen. And our heart sings. I think he's hit the nail on the head in terms of how many people attempted to think of the new heaven and earth, like it's a, a, a never ending worship service. Now, I like a good worship song, I like various types of music, but the idea of singing non-stop forever and ever, no matter how great God is, sounds like a little bit of a headache to me. It sounds like I'd get a bit fed up. It doesn't sound like heaven. Seems to me like after a few hundred years of blasting out choruses, it would probably get a little bit too much. Like Eldridge says in that quote, the idea might even make your heart sing. You might feel guilty for thinking that way. Isn't, isn't heaven supposed to be worshipping God forever? No need to feel guilty. Fortunately, the picture the Bible paints of what we'll do in heaven is not like that. It's much more interesting and rich. And whatever you love doing in this life, I suspect you'll get to do it a lot more. Plus, you'll have the time, the energy and the inclination to get involved in loads of other stuff too. So let's explore a little bit and see what we can look forward to in the areas particularly of work and rest. Firstly, work. About 2,800 years ago-ish, the enormous Old Testament book of Isaiah looked ahead and made loads of statements and predictions about the future which have come to pass and then there's a few in there which haven't happened just yet and here's one where Isaiah sort of speaks on, on behalf of God in, in chapter 65 and he says this look I am creating new heavens and a new earth and no one will even think about the old ones anymore be glad rejoice forever in my creation and look I'll create Jerusalem as a place of happiness her people will be a source of joy in those days, people will live in the houses they build and eat the fruit of their own vineyards. 
Unlike the past, invaders will not take their houses and confiscate their vineyards, for my people will live as long as trees, and my chosen ones will have time to enjoy their hard-won gains. They will not work in vain, and their children will not be doomed to misfortune, for they are people blessed by God. So Isaiah sets the scene, it's this new heaven and earth, there's this new Jerusalem, the city that's symbolic of God's rule and peace. And you can imagine Isaiah just sort of smiling wistfully as he imagines what people will be doing. And it's not just an endless church, it's building and harvesting vineyards and, and work with lots of eating and drinking around the edges. God's people will spend eternity working. Now, depending on your situation, you may recoil with horror at that sentence. If you love your job right now, maybe that sounds great. If you're loving retirement right now or you're really fed up with your job, maybe you're rolling your eyes. Why would I want to work? I'm spending all of this life trying to get to the point where I don't have to. Why would I want to work? But hold on a second. We were made to work. Humans are supposed to work, generally speaking. It brings us satisfaction and purpose. We need to do stuff. It's just in us. The 19th century priest, Father Baudrio, said on this, We are active by nature. Action, therefore, both of mind and body, is a law of our being, which cannot be managed without destroying our whole nature. Instead of destroying it, it follows that in heaven we shall be far more active than we can possibly be here. Really early in the Old Testament, it says that work has been made hard. It's become painful toil. Even in the most enjoyable job for the best suited person, there are moments when work is frustrating. For a lot of people through history, work has just felt like a necessary evil. The work God has ahead for us won't be like that. As we saw last week, you'll have a new body which won't get worn out. It also says in the Isaiah passage, we won't work in vain. There'll be no tedious, fruitless, niggly, annoying work. Work will be fun, challenging, rewarding, purposeful and custom fit to every one of us. Another Old Testament character, Amos, who my son is named after, said something similar. Amos chapter 9. The time will come, says the Lord, when the grain and grapes will grow faster than they can be harvested. Then the terraced vineyards on the hills of Israel will drip with sweet wine. They will plant vineyards and gardens. They will eat their crops and drink their wine. I'll firmly plant them there in their own land. They will never again be uprooted from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. Look at how it's all integrated. Work and rest building, planting, reaping the fruit, drinking the wine. It's starting to send, sound a lot less like a church service and a bit more like a gap year on a farm in the Italian countryside, which seems pretty good to me. By the way, I should say this. If you're someone who's into technology, you like your computers and gadgets and you think this is all sounding a little bit arable, don't worry. There's no reason to suspect there won't be technology. Technology is just what humans have built out of the resources the world has to offer. Why would that not continue? I think we're going to get loads of fun um, in the new heaven and earth, playing with all sorts of technology and inventing new things. But it gets even better than that. The Bible talks about God's people in the new heaven and earth reigning over creation alongside Jesus. That is mind-blowing, but it is the promise. Look at this. This is from a letter in the New Testament from a man called Paul to a man called Timothy. Paul had personally encountered Jesus turned his life around and on top of that he spent years thinking about the implications of Jesus resurrection and on the back of all of that thinking he says this one sentence amazing sentence to Timothy this saying is also trustworthy for if we have died with him we will also live with him if we endure we will also reign with him I love how Paul has to begin this thought by saying this is trustworthy it's like he's saying Timothy honestly mate you might find this hard to believe but the idea is that followers of, of Jesus, in a sense, die with him. We put aside our old selves, we become new people, and we live with him. And, it says, we reign with him. Now, live with him sounds, that, that seems to make sense, doesn't it? We'll be closely connected with him, can get my head around that. But reign with him. This is reign, R-E-I-G-N, like a king reigns over a kingdom. And Paul is saying, this is not the only place where he does, God's people will reign over the new heaven and earth alongside Jesus. We're like royalty. As always, with everything that God gives us that we see in the Bible, we did nothing to deserve or earn this. It's something God gifts to us. It's his idea. What does it mean to reign? In a nutshell, it means we will have significant responsibility. We'll have oversight of creation. 
There'll be cities to run and projects to manage, ideas to explore, things to make, stuff to learn, animals to care for, gardens to cultivate. Whatever you are good at, whatever you enjoy, will have a place. It's going to need wise leadership and cultivators and inventors, teachers, collaborators, people who are good with spreadsheets even, and many, many more. This is incredibly hopeful, incredibly dignifying for everyone. Apart from a relatively small number of people in history, most people who have lived in this world have had very little choice about what work they do. They just have to get on with it. It may not be enjoyable, it's just about getting things done and, and paying the bills. It's a modern luxury for the wealthy, by and large, that we have more of a choice about what we might do when we work. How many people in history have had unused talents or intelligence or contributions that because they were born into a certain society at a certain time, there was no opportunity to use them. That will not happen in the new heaven and earth. That will not happen to any of God's people. All the sadness, the regret, the waste is undone, along with all the unused talent. It will all be sorted out. The key, as always, is Jesus. In that little saying, Paul says, with him, three times. We get to do all this fulfilling work. We get treated like royalty. We get the responsibility of reigning with him, because he is the one that deserves all those things, is all, the, all those things, but came into our world to get us. So we will have the eternal privilege of working alongside and for him. And it will never cease to be enjoyable, even for a moment. Have I convinced you yet, this is going to be much better than an ultramarathon church service, as good as church services are? Second thing, rest. I know plenty of people who are just looking forward to having a rest. Some of us have, have already started this in our retirement. And when we think about maybe resting in heaven, heavenly rest, you hear that phrase, it's easy to imagine maybe just spending 18 hours of the day having naps, relaxing, just stopping, recharging, basically like what you do on holiday. Now, when our family go on holiday, we tend to do very little. It's brilliant. We try to go with some friends. We will sit by a pool, read books cook barbecues for everybody and maybe maybe like every three days we'll pop out to the beach for a few hours and then go back because we're a bit tired out and sit by the pool for a while absolutely love it it's brilliant but the best thing is that even after the best holidays I like coming home and reconnecting and getting on with work again I absolutely love holidays I want to have them but I really don't want to be on holiday forever I don't want to be on holiday forever the new heaven and earth will not be one continuous holiday that would eventually be really dissatisfying and dull but it will be restful one of the great bible passages about rest is in the new testament book of hebrews but we do know that whoever wrote it whenever it was they wrote to demonstrate how jesus fulfills loads of stuff in the old testament they must have been a bit of an old testament expert and in chapter four it starts talking about entering the rest of God, an interesting phrase. And here's the first bit. God's promise of entering his rest still stands. So we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. For this good news that God has prepared this rest has been announced to us just as it was to them. But it did them no good because they didn't share the faith of those who listened to God. For only we who believe can enter his rest. As for the others, God said, in my anger, I took an oath. They will never enter my place of rest even though this rest has been ready since he made the world. The author is telling us that resting with God has been ready since the year dot is waiting for us. He also makes it clear that it's a privilege for those who believe. In other words, people who follow Jesus. It's not something that comes automatically. Now, that will bring up lots of questions about you know, people who don't know Jesus and so on. We'll touch on that next week. But for now, look at how he describes rest. It's not just relaxation. It's that phrase, his rest. It's a type of rest very closely connected with God. He's promised it and he's prepared it. God's rest in the new heaven and earth is consistent with what he's like. Let's go back to Hebrews 4 and look at how it continues to explain rest. We know it is ready because of the place in the scriptures where it mentions the seventh day. On the seventh day, God rested from all his work. But in the other passage, God said, they will never enter my place of rest. So God's rest is there for people to enter. But those who first heard this good news failed to enter because they disobeyed God. So there is a special rest still waiting for the people of God. For all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labours, just as God did after creating the world. So let us do our best to enter that rest. But if we disobey God as the people of Israel did, we will fall. In this life, 
God patterns rest through the Genesis creation story, six days work, one day rest. But I wonder if in heaven we'll maybe follow a similar pattern, because it certainly is a good one. Either way, we will work, but we will also rest. And it will be better rest than we can ever achieve in this life. In this life, we have different forms of rest. One thing that comes through the Bible is the gift of Sabbathing, of taking a day like we just saw, one every seven. And you don't absolutely have to do that, but it is a gift. Why wouldn't you? A day to, to, to rest each week. Now, if you observe a Sabbath, that 24 hours, I, I try and do this with my family, myself. It's not just sleeping all day. Sometimes it is. In the main, it's not just sleeping all day. It's restful activity. It's stuff that's fun and life-giving and healthy for the soul. There's every reason to think the new heaven and earth will promise the same, but better. Around the work God gives us, it's fair to imagine we will also enjoy doing all the stuff that we find restful now. Whether that's playing sports or reading or painting or, or music or, yes, maybe even having a nap. Given that we will have eternity, imagine how good we'll be at the things we get ourselves devoted to. How, how knowledgeable we'll be. And we'll have time to take on new interests as well. And this is really encouraging if you're in despair about life just now. In our world, there's so much pressure to get stuff done, work longer and longer hours. If you've got small children, you'll know they are exhausting. Maybe lockdown will change some of this. It won't change the children thing. It might change some of the other stuff. Who knows? But do you ever have that feeling like you've lost time? You've missed out on investing in a hobby or an interest. Maybe you'd love to try something, but it's really expensive. So you, you can't easily have a go. That's not going to be a problem. Really exciting part of this, I think, though, is the capacity we're going to have to learn new things. Last week, we looked at how God will give us new bodies that are not limited by the effects of ageing or bad health. He'll finish the work of transforming our character. Add to that infinite time and opportunity and the meeting of all the cultures of the world through history. Imagine what we'll be able to learn. It'll be fascinating. All the brilliant things that have been invented and created and discovered will still be there and they'll be built upon forever. Without the possibility of death and without the effects of sin, of our wrongdoing on how we think and how we work with one another, we will be free to invent new things and explore the universe God made in a way that is levels above what we can do right now. Just imagine. The enjoyably named author and Bible scholar Sam Storms puts it like this. What we do now is not discarded once we enter eternity. What we learn now is not erased in heaven. What we experience in joy and understanding and insight now is not destroyed, but is the foundation on which all our eternal experience and growth is based. This irresistible combination of work and rest will be forever satisfying and positive and attention grabbing. Boredom is completely off the table. So that's work and rest in a new heaven and earth. Now think back to the thing I said at the start about how we're tempted to imagine heaven as a sort of continuous church service. And actually, heaven will be continual worship, but not only through singing and other things we might do at church that will play a part, but through forever appreciating and enjoying and pointing to God in a million different ways. The new heaven and earth is going to be so wonderful, so comforting and breathtaking at the same time. All anybody will want to do is worship and celebrate the God who put it all together. The 19th century academic Archibald Hogg, Hodge, I should say, described how this fits together in one fantastic paragraph. He says, heaven as the eternal home of the divine man, Jesus, and of all the redeemed members of the human race must necessarily be thoroughly human in its structure, conditions and activities. Its joys and activities must all be rational, moral, emotional, voluntary and active. There must be the exercise of all these faculties, the gratification of all tastes, the development of all talent capacities, the realisation of all ideals, the reason, the intellectual curiosity, the imagination, the aesthetic instincts, holy affections, the social affinities, the inexhaustible resources of strength and power native to the human soul must all find in heaven exercise and satisfaction. Then there must always be a goal of endeavour before us, ever future. Heaven will prove the consummate flower and fruit of the whole creation and of all the history of the universe. Pretty epic, eh? If you're a follower of Jesus, everything you want from work and rest and more is going to be fully realised. It's all brilliant. So, 
what on earth, we always ask this question, does this have to do with now? Sounds like a great thing in the future. What about now? Here's two thoughts that seem to be in contradiction, but you need both to be true. And they can only be true if the Christian message is true. Number one, everything now is temporary. Knowing that everything here and now is temporary is a complete perspective changer, especially in how we see work and rest. If your life is really hard or, or even really dull right now, and it's, it is those things because of circumstances you can't control, wait and see. It will not always be this way. Knowing what's coming should give you perseverance and joy and optimism. You might have to ride it out for a while now, but you can know it will not be this way forever with Jesus. On the other hand, if your life is really safe and dull because you've made it that way, because you've built it all for comfort and safety, the encouragement here is get out of your chair and take some risks. You can have a safe and yet exciting eternity mapped out ahead of you. You can afford to do things in this life which disadvantage you greatly. Stop living, if you're a Christian, stop living like this life is the pinnacle. You can be crazy generous and weirdly sacrificial and throw your time into really inconvenient things because you will get everything back and more. Everything now is temporary, but at the same time, number two, everything now is significant. One amazing passage of the Bible is 1 Corinthians 15, this epic letter written to the Corinthian church. And it's the longest chunk of the Bible that talks about the idea of resurrection. And it starts with Jesus' miraculous resurrection, which at the time of writing was quite recent. And then at the end of the chapter, it has this amazing closing line. So, my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. There's something about the resurrection of Jesus and the future resurrection of his people that means what we do now is never useless. And note that it doesn't mention super Christian sounding things like being a missionary or starting an orphanage. It says what you do for the Lord. What you do for God is never useless. Some of us maybe feel like what we do is useless. Honestly, if it's for the Lord, it isn't. Anything you do in this life, whether it's raising a child, baking bread, handling some accounts, if it's for God, it is not useless. I heard this great story. The French composer Olivier Messiaen was at the peak of his powers when he was put in a Nazi concentration camp in 1941. It was brutal, of course, and living life at all, let alone composing, was really hard. But he began reading the Bible, he became a follower of Jesus, and it filled him with hope. As it turned out, there were three other great musicians in the camp too, and they managed to find four beaten up old instruments, and Messiaen composed some music called Quartet for the End of Time. And it was later regarded as a masterpiece, one of the great works of the 20th century. They played it for the first time one freezing January to the prisoners and guards in the snow. And this is a picture of how the resurrection reshapes how we work now. We work now in the middle, quite often, of pain and mess for a glimpse of the future world free of suffering and death. And we hope that people see us play, so to speak, shivering in the cold. And so that they would start to see that despite everything that goes on in this life, something much greater is coming and it's already breaking in. Everything now is significant. So we work hard, but we also get to rest now too. Our world encourages us to be chaotically busy because of the underlying assumption that this is all there is and you need to squeeze everything out of life now, 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 now. But for God's people, we can work hard and rest hard because we know we have all the time in the world. Thank you, God. Let me pray. Father God, thank you for what you have ahead for your people. We are sorry for when we put too much of our hope into this world and for when we fail to love people because we're distracted by our own pleasure and our own lives. We're sorry too for when we fail to rest because we buy into the idea that this life is the whole show, it's the whole thing. Thank you that in Jesus' resurrection there is hope and that everything we do now is somehow both temporary and significant. And I pray for anyone listening in on this who is checking out what we believe as Christians and ask that you would meet with them personally and they would discover the hope of heaven and the joy that is to come. Amen. Have a great week.